I did a hardcore nuzlocke of Pokemon Heart Gold using only bug type Pokemon, which means that if a Pokemon faints in battle, it's dead forever, and I can only catch the very first bug type I find on each route. So every encounter matters, especially with the extra hardcore rule set. My starter is irrelevant since none of them are bugs, so I pick the frog because we'll need him for surf later on. Then after unwillingly serving as an informant to the police, I can head to Route 30 and catch my de facto starter, a Caterpie named Potatoes. How about the nice tasty verb on a stick? After a bit of leveling up, our wriggling rascal evolves into a beautiful Butterfree, and then it's not long until we welcome teammate number two, Turkey the Spinnerack, a classic case of a pretty cool Pokemon done absolutely dirty by a horrendous level up moveset. We call that the Johto Special. But Little Turkey's bug poison typing makes him the perfect answer into taking out the armada of level 3 bell sprouts in Sprout Tower. Oh yeah, now this is peak gameplay. At the end of Sprout Tower is a fight against Elder Lee, which has got to be one of the subtlest puns I've ever seen. Brilliant. Now, Elder Lee has a Hoot Hoot, which threatens our bug types with super effective flying attacks. One Hoot is no problem, but two Hoots? We've got a potential disaster on our hands here, folks. Fortunately, Potatoes remembers Harden from her brief stint as a Metapod, so against Elder Lee's Bellsprout, we can set up a few to raise our defenses, which means that once Double Hoot comes out, the only thing we have to worry about is a critical hit. Okay, well he doesn't get a second critical hit, so Potatoes is able to best the spherical bird of prey with a few confusions. Though then, we have to go straight from there into the fight against the first gym leader, Faulkner, who also has some pretty powerful flying types. Oh. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay, powerful is a stretch, but this is still potentially problematic. Fortunately, unlike Two Hoot, who has the ability Insomnia, Potatoes is free to put Faulkner's birds to sleep with 97.5% accurate sleep powders. We can take out the Pidgey with two confusions before he wakes up. Faulkner's second and final Pokemon Pidgeotto is a bit bulkier and not as easy to take out. We can still outspeed to put him to sleep, but our confusions aren't all that strong, especially thanks to Potatoes' minus special attack nature and pitiful special attack IV. At the very least, we can use a Twisted Spoon to boost the power of confusion just a bit, and with decent sleep luck, it's safe to whittle away at Pidgeotto until eventually Potatoes proves himself to be the master of the sky, and victory is ours. After that, Professor Elm calls to give me a mysterious egg, but everyone knows that bugs don't hatch from eggs, so this is pretty useless. Still, I have to take it to advance the story, so I gotta figure out something to do with it. Once we've arrived in Azalea Town and driven out Team Rocket, I can make my way to the second gym where I'll be facing off against Bugsy, a fellow Bug-type enthusiast. Name's a bit on the nose, but regardless, this guy's Scyther is a problem. We can hit her for super effective damage with Potatoes, who now knows Gust, but our paper-thin defenses means that we can't survive too many hits from Scyther's technician-boosted quick attacks, so it's again gonna come down to sleep luck, which sucks. Hey Flygon, would you say that this Scyther is bugging you? Scyther tends to spend a few turns going for Focus Energy and Leer, so if we're lucky, we might be able to get off some free hits. But my hopes are instantly dashed as the Bladed Bug starts immediately going for Quick Attack. Our Sleep Powder connects, so we're free to get off a few Gusts as Scyther takes a generously long snooze. Though, as you can see, Gust isn't exactly doing gangbuster damage, especially when you consider that Scyther's holding a Citrus Berry. By the time our enemy wakes up from her nap, we've brought her down to below half HP, and I timed it perfectly to instantly put her back to sleep after tanking another quick attack. So as long as Scyther stays asleep for just a few more turns, we've got this in the bag. I decide to go for a confusion first because I don't want to trigger a heal by bringing Scyther into the red. It works perfectly and it looks like just one last gust will get the KO as long as Scyther stays asleep for one more turn. And she does! Which means that Potatoes can fire off another gust, which kit. Missing out on the KO here by this slimmest of margins effectively signs Potato's death certificate, because Bugsy heals with a super potion. And even though we can get off two more gusts, Scyther does ultimately wake up and snuff the life out of sweet potatoes. 
For a moment, I thought we had that. We were shining on top of the world, beaming like the colors of autumn so bright just before they lose it all. The silver lining is that Potatoes did manage to do enough damage to Scyther so that Turkey can avenge his death with just a few nightshades. And since Bugsy's remaining two Pokemon are a Metapod and a Kakuna, Turkey can also close out this battle and win us the second gym badge. But now it's just me and Turkey versus the world. And unfortunately, in order to progress, we need to face down our rival in-law, which honestly isn't an impossible battle for Turkey to solo, except that in-law's lead Ghastly hits us with a curse. So Turkey's losing 25% of his HP every turn, which means that it doesn't take long for her to fall, marking the end of attempt one. Filled with frustration, it's back to square one. Thankfully, this is still a relatively early wipe, and I can make a few adjustments to hopefully prevent it from happening a second time. After once again confusing Faulkner's Jotonian flyers to death and making it back to Azalea Town, here are the new versions of Potatoes and Turkey. Potatoes still has a minus special attack nature, but she at least has a much better IV. Turkey, on the other hand, is now a boy and adopted a sassy nature, the exact opposite of his previous naive nature. Before heading to the gym, though, I make sure to first fight In-Law, who is simply no match for the overwhelming duo of Potatoes and Turkey. By beating him, we can head into Ilex Forest, where I catch my third teammate, a Paris named Yams. An impish nature is actually pretty incredible for her, but even with this extra body, the fight against Bugsy still boils down to sleep turns with Potatoes. Once again, we get Scyther down in to the yellow before she wakes up and nails Potatoes with a second quick attack. Potatoes 2.0, or Potutos, seems to have a bit more bulk, so it looks like he might be able to survive three hits. With Scyther on her way to Dreamland for the second time, we again start whittling away with gusts. But unlike in attempt one, Scyther's second nap is brutally short. Quick attack comes out, and gets the high roll, once again ruthlessly killing Potatoes. But at least this time she was able to clear the path to Ilex Forest, meaning that Turkey, and I guess technically also Yams, are able to beat Bugsy and then keep Attempt 2 alive as we make our way to Goldenrod City. Bye bye Butterfree, you will be missed. And even though you didn't make it to the end, the rest of our journey is only possible thanks to your sacrifice. Rest in peace, Potatoes. Our next stop is Route 35, in search of the coveted 1% Yanma, aka Lil Fly. In this reality, his name is Cranberry, and in addition to inexplicably being one of my favorite Pokemon, he's also indirectly essential to the health and viability of this run, because Cranberry here can learn Headbutt. And by learning Headbutt, we can now go back to Azalea Town and encounter a Heracross. But not just any Heracross, a plus attack natured Guts Heracross named Gravy because he got the sauce. Gravy was born with a lonely nature, perhaps because he destroys everything in his path. He feasts on the feeble and sleeps on a bed made of bones of the weak. And by annihilating 4,334.4 pounds of Pidgeon Centred on Route 29, I've molded the natural born killer into a completely unstoppable monster. Also, I caught a pineco named Pecan Pie. She's, she's very cute. But let's focus on Gravy right now because he's about to plow Johto like a field. Unlike 95% of his Jotonian brethren, Heracross was given usable stats, a pretty decent move pool, and a game-changing ability. Guts boosts a Pokemon's attack stat by 50% if they're inflicted with a status condition, which means that by pre-burning or pre-poisoning Gravy before every major battle, he's able to use his monstrous 125 base attack stat to eviscerate almost anything in the game that he manages to outspeed and can hit for neutral damage. So, for example, Whitney normal types are now a complete joke. I didn't even bother pre-burning Gravy here, which almost punishes me, since Miltank actually survives a super effective Brick Break to nail us with an attract. But with some switches through Pecan Pie, Gravy can come back in and win the third gym badge without any problems. And since Gravy can learn Shadow Claw, he can also pretty easily sweep through Morty, but I wanted to give Sweet Turkey a chance here. He's evolved into Ariados and knows the priority move Shadow Sneak, which isn't all that powerful, but is certainly enough to kill some of Morty's physically frail ghost types, starting first with his lead Ghastly. His second Pokemon, Haunter, hangs on with a Sliver, which means he gets off a curse. So as 
as Gengar comes in, I think it's best for Turkey to call it quits. Gravy comes in on a failed sucker punch and then gets a clean one shot with Shadow Claw. Mind you, we haven't even used the Guts boost yet. A second and final Shadow Claw against Morty's second Haunter wins us another easy victory over the fourth gym leader. Which means we can head to Cyanwood City to get our sixth team member, a Shuckle, who my Uncle Jim Tendo helps me nickname Bread. He'll be useful a bit later, but for now it's time to get back on the Gravy Train. Against the fifth gym leader Chuck, Gravy slices through his Primeape with a single Aerial Ace. His Polyrath is a fair bit bulkier and doesn't get close to getting knocked out in one shot, which means he can put us to sleep with Hypnosis. Again, pre-burning Gravy would trivialize this matchup, but we gotta let our other teammates have some fun, and Yams was born for this fight. Her dry skin ability makes her immune to surf, and Body Slam doesn't do much damage either. I mean, it obviously still paralyzes because Body Slam has like a 100% chance of paralysis, but we can put Polyrath to sleep with Spore and then whittle away with Bullet Seed. Yams ends up making this significantly harder than it has to be by landing only two hits with Bullet Seed twice in a row, causing Polyrath to heal. But she makes up for it by never getting fully paralyzed and clutching out the victory a few turns later with 13 HP to spare. What's life without a bit of risk, you know? With that, I decide to head back to National Park and get another encounter during the bug catching contest. Unfortunately, there's a lot of Pokemon that are found exclusively in National Park, most notably Scyther and Pinsir. Normally, Nuzlocke rules dictate that you can only catch one Pokemon per route, which means that I can't get both Scyther and Pinsir. In certain runs, especially monotype runs like this, I've allowed myself to break that rule and catch every eligible Pokemon, regardless of route restrictions, since the spirit of the one encounter per route rule is really just meant to limit your encounters and make you use Pokemon you don't normally use, which is already taken care of by the monotype restriction. It's kind of a hat on a hat situation in runs like this, and only morons wear multiple hats, that's just stupid. But for this monotype run, I decided to honor the one encounter per route rule, since I knew I'd be getting a guaranteed Heracross, and there are a decent number of encounters regardless. So, long story short, I'm only going to catch the first bug type Pokemon I find during the bug catching contest. Ideally, it's a Scyther, of course, but I would settle for a Pinsir. Well, that's a bummer, but you gotta work with what you got. And apparently what I got is an award-winning Weedle because somehow I managed to win the bug catching contest with my level 11 Weedle. I have no idea how that's possible, but welcome to the team, Corn. Somewhat vain? I'd be too if I won a bug catching contest as a frickin' Weedle. Anyways, next up is a trip to Route 43 to look for a Venonat. I can also potentially catch Venonat in the Lake of Rage, so my plan is to try to determine if this one has the ability Compound Eyes or Tinted Lens before I try catching it. The latter ability is much more preferable, so if I can figure out that this Venonet has compound eyes, I can just run away and try again. Fortunately, after a few turns, Venonat misses a Poison Powder, which with compound eyes would have 97.5% accuracy. So that's a pretty good indication that she has Tinted Lens, which means I go for the catch. And nope, she was just unlucky. Well, this thing is useless. After clearing through the rocket hideout, Cranberry evolves into Yan Mega, aka Not So Lil Fly. I promise that he'll get some actual screen time soon, but for now I just click Brick Break three times into Price's Pokemon for Gym Badge number six. Is someone hammering? Even Burn, Gravy can't guarantee a one shot against Jasmine's bulky Steelix, so after smacking her two Magnemides into next week, I switch to Pecan Pie on an Iron Tail, which crits and gets a defense drop. So I switch into Bread on a Screech, and then back into Pecan Pie on another Iron Tail that now does not crit or get the defense drop. And from here, I start spamming Dig, which doesn't do a crazy amount of damage, but it does do more than Iron Tails, which also don't exactly have the best accuracy in the game. A few turns later, Pecan Pie seals the deal with a critical hit, and the seventh gym badge is ours. In Goldenrod City, my rival, and every single member of Team Rocket, gets completely devastated by the Gravy Train. There's really not much to discuss here other than the fact that I've now taught him Facade, which is a move that doubles in power if the user is inflicted with a status condition. So Gravy now has a free 140 base power normal type move to spam into anything that happens to resist his stab fighting type attacks. You smell that? It kinda smells like rat power. Well, except I guess it's more like rhinoceros beetle power. 
All that's left for us in Johto is the fight against the 8th gym leader Claire, but she's about to be minced into a pie by the gravy train. Now I did kinda forget that she leads with a Gyarados who has Intimidate to drop our attack stat, but fortunately this Gyarados has a horrendous moveset, which means I can pretty safely switch into Yams, hit him with a slow Spore, and then get the safe switch back into Gravy on Gyarados' first turn of sleep. And then, pop goes the Weasel. The Weasel in this case being Gravy. Or maybe Claire is the weasel. To be honest, I'm not sure whether the weasel popping is good for the weasel or if it's good for the individual responsible for doing said popping. I, I don't know, but one way or another, a metaphorical weasel has been popped and Claire has been defeated. So my bugs and I are off to the Elite Four, and it's here where we'll face our toughest challenge yet. While the members of the Elite Four are not exactly difficult, the Champion Lance is really tricky, especially given that all of his Pokémon are part Flying type and we don't have access to a single Ice type move for his Dragonites. But somehow, this final team will have to make it work or die trying. I opted for Turkey over Corn for one specific reason, but the rest of my team is made up of the standard Pokémon that have been with us throughout the playthrough and are all leveled up to level 47 to match the level of Karen's Ace Houndoom. So let's see if they've got what it takes to become champions of the Pokémon League. We are gonna knock them dead! <laughs> First up is Will, and unfortunately for him, all of his Pokémon are outsped and one-shot by Silk Scarf boosted facades from Gravy. Sorry William, but sometimes that's just the way things shake out. The second member of the Elite Four is Koga, who has a speedy Crobat and therefore cannot be safely swept by Gravy. Instead, it's finally not so Lil Fly's time to shine. With a choice specs, her ancient power is enough to one-shot Koga's lead area dose. Then, thanks to her speed boost ability, she can outspeed the Crobat who comes in next. A single ancient power isn't enough for a knockout, but Crobat can't threaten with a one-shot in return and instead just goes for double team. Cranberry is having absolutely none of that though, as another ancient power connects and kills Crobat before things get too annoying. Venomoth is third, so Cranberry takes her third kill with yet another ancient power, leaving Koga with just two more Pokémon. The first is Fortress, who threatens with Explosion, so I swap out to Bread. My plan is to slowly whittle away at Fortress with Rap, but he seems to see the writing on the wall and decides that it's better to go out quickly with Dignity on his own terms. Probably a good call. That means that last is Muck, who cannot do damage to Steel types, so Pecan Pie comes in and starts nailing him with Paybacks, which appear to completely ignore Muck's minimizes. Like, seriously, Pecan Pie doesn't miss a single time. She's a stone-cold killer. A few turns later, Muck falls, and victory is ours. Which means it's back to the gravy train, baby. He single-handedly kills all of Bruno's Pokémon and all of Karen's. I'd feel bad if it wasn't for what's coming up next. Seriously, Lance is horrifying. Even though this playthrough has been pretty simple since Bugsy, just a little bit of bad luck here could lead to a full-blown wipe, and at this point, there's not much I can do about it. So as the championship battle begins, I'm terrified that this will be the end of Attempt 2. Lance leads with a Gyarados, so I lead with Yams. She's holding a Yachi Berry to reduce the power of Gyarados's Ice Fang, which generously doesn't freeze or flinch, letting her nail him with a Spore. That gives me the safe switch to Gravy, who can take the kill with a Silk Scarf boosted facade. Charizard gets baited in next, and he too is soft enough to go down to a single facade. But here's where things get interesting. Aerodactyl is third and completely outspeeds my entire team. So it's off to Pecan Pie, the only one of my Pokémon that doesn't take super effective damage from either one of the Winged Beast's stab moves. Rock Slide still hits hard and has a chance to flinch, but we're able to tank one and get off a strong payback. The second Rock Slide misses, which means that PP can go for rest to get back to full HP with her Chesto Berry instantly waking her up. Aerodactyl's next Rock Slide also misses, so another payback brings our foe into the red. That causes Lance to heal, but at least it lets us fire off another payback. Aerodactyl's next Rock Slide connects for a huge chunk of damage as another payback brings him back to a sliver. Lance is done healing though, and instead goes for another Rock Slide, which this time gets a brutal flinch. That means that we're risking a crit now, but we gotta do it. Another Rock Slide comes out, 
and Pecan Pie survives, but gets flinched again. The RNG in this battle is already wildly out of control. I switch to Turkey, who's held Focus Sash, ensures that he'll always survive at least one hit from Aerodactyl. Then, on the following turn, he can use a Priority Sucker Punch to finish off Aerodactyl's last tick of HP. But now, it's time for the trio of Dragonites, starting first with the one at level 50. And here, it's time for Turkey to fulfill his destiny. He was never going to survive this fight. The plan was to always bring him in against Lance's main Dragonite and deal just a smidgen of damage with Sucker Punch before going down. It might not be much, but without it, we'd be done for. Because with that tiny amount of chip, Gravy can come back in and get a guaranteed kill on Lance's monstrous Dragonite with one more facade. Thank you so much for your sacrifice, Turkey. You'll be remembered as a killer of giants and a god amongst men. Sadly, this battle is nowhere near over because Lance has two Dragonites left and it's a roll to kill them both. Facade gets the KO on the first Dragonite roughly 75% of the time, but if we miss the KO here, my team has no chance of beating Lance's third and final Flying Barney. So I gotta switch out to Bread, who's gonna need the performance of a lifetime to make it out in one piece. He tanks a pretty nasty Dragon Rush, but without crits, he should be able to survive just a few more. On the next turn, Dragonite hits us with a Thunder Wave, which gets healed by a Rest that also allows us to get back to full HP. Then Dragonite goes for another Another nasty Dragon Rush, which flinches. Shh. Well, Dragonite goes for a Thunder Wave next, which causes a full paralysis. Double sh. Well, another Dragon Rush brings us into the yellow, letting Shuckle fire off a flash to lower Dragon Rush's accuracy from 75% down to 56.25%. Pretty good odds to dodge, right? Well, instead, Dragonite connects and gets another flinch. And then this mother has the audacity to connect with a 52.5% accurate thunder, ending a disastrous outing for poor bread. Probability is kind of tricky to calculate in these situations, but given that Dragon Rush only has a 20% chance to flinch, the odds of all of this happening were pretty freaking low, man. RIP bread, that was some serious bullshit, and I am sorry. At this point, I've got limited options. Cranberry can two-shot Dragonite with Choice Specs Ancient Power, but since he has a speed IV of zero, and Dragonite has a plus speed nature, we don't outspeed until we get a speed boost. But the only way for Dragonite to one-shot us here is by connecting with another 52.5% accurate Thunder and getting the high roll. So you'll never guess what happens. Sometimes this game, man, you just... <sighs> okay, well, with Not So Lil Fly unceremoniously killed off, my only choice is to bring Gravy back in and desperately hope that we don't low roll our facades. Because if we do, I'm dead. Our first facade comes out, and Lance's second Dragonite falls. The good news is that this bumps Gravy up to level 51, which adjusts the damage roll to guarantee a kill roughly 82.5% of the time on the final Dragonite. Still a damage roll, but the odds are now slightly more in our favor. So, one last facade comes out, and Dragonite goes down, winning us the battle against Lance and sending my bugs to the Hall of Fame. It stings to know that Bread and Cranberry basically died for nothing, but I do stand by my decisions there since the loss of Gravy to Lance's second Dragonite would have almost certainly been game over. We could sit here lamenting their deaths, or we could celebrate their lives and honor their sacrifices by forging forward. Because this is heart gold, baby, and we're not done with the run until the gym leaders of Kanto and Trainer Red have been put in their place. After getting the national decks from Professor Oak, the first thing I do is head to Cliff Cave, where I find a claw fossil. Then it is indeed off to Kanto via the SS Aqua, where I soon arrive in Vermilion City. After headbutting a few trees, I catch a wormpole named Stuffing, who quickly evolves into a beautifly. Along with the revived Anorith named Squash from the Pewter City Museum, we've got a full team as we face off against the Cantonian gym leaders. Almost all of them are notoriously pretty easy, but even so, I'm stunned by how many of them get swept by Stuffing the beautifly. I did not have beating Brock with Beautifly on my bingo card for this playthrough. The only one of the gym leaders that poses a serious threat or even has a full team is the 16th and 
final gym leader, Blue. He leads with Exeggutor, which has a very piss poor matchup into Stuffing, who can easily outspeed and nuke the Palm Tree with a nasty quad affected Bug Buzz. But that then brings in Blue's terrifying Arcanine. So it's finally time to fulfill the ancient prophecy, passed down for generations from a time long lost. A daughter of Johto, eyes bright red. Abandoned and useless was what had been said. A purpose for life found in death. She must choke so that others have breath. No hearts will ache, no pain will be felt. Cruel may it be, it's the hand that was dealt. Gone in a flame, she must pay the toll. So be the fate of young Casserole. With the free switch to Gravy, he can take out Arcanine with a close combat, and then he runs it back for clean one-shots against Pidgeot and Rhydon as well. That brings Gyarados out fifth, so with another Intimidate, I switch to Yams, who has weirdly become our go-to Gyarados counter. Her dry skin grants her the free switch, and then a held Yachi Berry lets her tank another ice f Okay, nope, never mind, that just straight up misses. So Spore freely connects with Gyarados, granting the safe switch back to Gravy, who unencumbered by Intimidate can get another one-hit kill with Facade. So all that's left is Machamp, who also falls to a single facade, winning us the final gym badge of the run. That means that all we have left is the fight against Red on top of Mount Silver. Rather frustratingly, we need to use Rock Climb to get there, and none of my bug types can learn it, so I have to bring the special flying Totodile that my Uncle Jim Tendo gave me. Which means that Corn is sitting this one out. But, uh, well, if you've been paying attention, you might have noticed that a certain Pokemon has trivialized large portions of this run, and... Red may or may not be totally eviscerated by said certain Pokemon. Pikachu falls to an Earthquake, Charizard falls to a Facade, Lapras, Snorlax, and Blastoise all go down to a close combat, and then Venusaur also goes down to a Facade. But you know what? This is the season of giving thanks and sharing. It's a time to be surrounded by friends and family and celebrate the joys of communal experience. And what's more communal than working together to kill a Venusaur? So instead of having Gravy go for his sixth kill of the fight, I switch to Pecan Pie on a Sludge Bomb. Venusaur then misses a Sleep Powder on the following turn, allowing us to fire off a Payback for free. A second Sleep Powder does connect, which means means that Venusaur stays at about 50% as he fires off a nasty frenzy plant. But then with a sleep talk, we hit him with another payback. And after that, I switch to Stuffing as Venusaur recharges. So, with one final Psychic, Stuffing closes out the collective team effort of knocking out Venusaur, winning us not just the battle against Red, but the entire run. In all seriousness, this time of year is a great time to think about what you're thankful for, regardless of what you do or do not celebrate. And as I look back on the year, filled with ups and downs, one thing I'm immensely thankful for is the continued support from so many viewers. I know I say it often, but even then, it's not enough. Thank you for letting me do what I do, for helping me live out this weird dream come true, and for helping me continue to grow as a content creator and as a person. Please use this sappy ending to a silly Pokemon challenge video as an excuse to tell someone in your life that you're thinking about them and that you're grateful for what they've done for you. Anyways, I am really excited for these next couple of videos that are going to close out the end of the year, so please stay tuned for all of that. Until then, remember to always, always, always play around the critical hit. Hey, watch it, watch it! I'm sorry, I'm sorry, is the camera broke? Oh, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, did I ruin the tank?